All right, so what I want to do is just go back to chapter 14. We spent the morning doing our math. So now I want to kind of get into some more details about MedAdmin and stuff like that. We've talked to... Yes? Okay, back to class. So when we're talking about meds, we've... Um, We've discussed several different theories about how the medication is going to work in the body. Now we need to talk about how to get the medication into the body and how to do it safely. Um, just like the wrong medication could cause a problem, uh, the wrong method of administration, or even if we're using the correct route, if our technique is bad, it can be just as dangerous. So, of course, there's multiple ways in which we could um, administer medications. So, let's look at that. Um, no, no pressure. Patient survival just depends on your abilities. No pressure at all. So, all right. Um, medical direction. I think we've covered this pretty well. So I'm not really going to talk much more about medical direction. I feel like we kind of understand that. Um, obviously when you're in doubt contact medical control but as i've said before i will keep saying this every opportunity because i want this stuck in your head when we contact medical control we should not be hey doc my patient's doing this what should i do that's not helpful and you know what you're gonna get you're gonna get uh don't touch anything get them here fast that's the answer that you're gonna get because if you're not competent enough to know what is in your scope of practice to do and explain that to the doc, the doc's not going to trust you to know anything um, so or do anything. So when we contact medical control, it's like, hey, I think I should give this medication. It's, hey, doc, this is so-and-so, medic so-and-so. We are en route to your facility with a patient that fits this, that's this, this, this. Don't need all their history. You know, we need, we have a patient who is semi-conscious, complaining of uh, chest pain, has a heart rate of 200 with a narrow complex irregular rhythm. And we are requesting orders for uh, giving cardizem 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. You don't call the doc and say, hey, my patient's unconscious and their heart rate's through the roof and their blood pressure's crap and like, what do you want me to do? Because he's, he, she's not going to know what's at your disposal. So you present the problem and you suggest a solution. Doctor can say, no, let's hold off on the cardizem. Um, but, or might say, nah, just go ahead and shock them. Okay, we'll shock them. But you presented a recommendation and you need to be able to do that. So when you're contacting medical control about, is this the right dose? Is this the right patient? Is this the right time or the right medication? Um, should I do this? Always have a quite clear, this is what I'm looking at and this is what I'm trying to do. Is this the right, uh, thinking the right way here are you okay with me doing this um basically you already have a plan and you want them to um approve or disapprove plan. so we've talked about this you know your drug cards your protocol book all that kind of stuff confirm that you have the right medication that there's no contraindications the patient's not uh you know allergic to it you know exactly how much is being given how much the volume that you're going to give you've done all your drug calculations you are set all right when you document medication it is really important um but he's saying something and there <laughs> Something going on in um oh okay the noonan folks lost their internet connection they'll be back all right okay so when we're giving the medication it is really important that we document it appropriately um give you an example of that um so I'm going to go back to our uh, the page that we had earlier. There. <laughs> 
No. All right, so let's say that we're, we're taking care of a patient with asthma, all right? So we say that um, patient was complaining of shortness of breath, blah, 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 and we'll, when I document giving albuterol, I'll record this, something along these lines, patient, oh. Sorry, all right. Stated uh, they were being and wheezes noted in all globes with increase. All right, so what are my what have I just documented? I've documented a lot of assessment. You know, we're obviously we're there for trouble breathing. I'm not putting in all of my all of the background. I'm not throwing everything in here right now. This is getting directly to what's going on with my patient's complaint, right? I'm listed that they're having a hard time breathing. They have or they have a complaint of a hard time breathing. They have significant wheezes on auscultation. They have increased respiratory effort. They have prolonged expiration. Their respiratory rate is elevated. Their SpO2 is low. So we have a sick patient. We have a problem that we need to take care of here. So what are we going to do? I am going to record it as this. We'll do it like this. At 1327. <laughs> All right, so I gave my med at 1327, albuterol 2.5 milligrams uh, via neb or just neb or however you want to say it. So I've listed what time I gave it, how, what the drug was, how much I gave, and what the route of administration was. All right. Now, but my documentation isn't over because now I need to record what happened after the med. And what I can do is, you know, let's say the patient improved. So patient reported a decrease in breathing effort uh, rate was 24 so it's gone down spo2 rose to 97 percent wheezes noted in upper lobes only Um, oh, X. Um, time decreased. Patient appeared to be. All right, so what did I do? I've recorded what findings I had with my patient, you know, what was unhealthy. Then I recorded what I did, and now I'm recording the result, the reassessment. So I assessed the patient, identified a problem, uh, accomplished an intervention, and then uh, reassessed and recorded that reassessment. So this is an important detail on um, our documentation of MedAdmin because if you didn't record your reassessment, it probably means you didn't do it. And that's not actually helping anyone. Um, so 
different programs, different uh, uh, PCR systems, uh, different departments will all have a different way of trying to um, record their medication administrations and things like that. So um, you may, your department may not want you to add this much detail into a narrative, um, but when you record in your uh what's it called your flow chart of the, all the different interventions you record the medication it needs to include what was the route how much was given what time was it given and whether associated com uh, complications but you really do need to record somewhere and this is why i always put it in my narrative here are the um assessment findings that i had that suggested i needed me to give this medication and here is the reassessment suggesting the medication did its job or it you know was intended when somebody reads your narrative a specific especially when we're dealing with med admin you need to have enough detail that as they're reading they're thinking oh yes i see this problem that must mean their patient has asthma i'm I think they should give albuterol. Oh, look, the provider administered albuterol. All right, so, well, was it asthma? Did the albuterol work? Did it change? Oh, look, it did change. Here's here's the evidence of the assessment. That means the albuterol was the solution. It was asthma. And it's kind of like a further confirmation of what you previously were suspecting or considering to be your, prime, your differential diagnosis. It's like if you gave the albuterol and the patient's um, breathing did not improve well then it's possible that the origin of the trouble breathing was not asthma or copd and was not bronchial constriction as a result of that it could be maybe it was an inhalation injury or a burn or um pulmonary edema or whoever knows what else but it was some other concern causing this issue and not what you thought it was so you record that your treatment was ineffective and now uh you're moving on to a new treatment So documentation is really important with that, especially with QAQI, because if people can't look at your documentation and see what you were thinking and see how you handled the patient, then you are not going to be able to have effective QAQI. And quality QA being quality assessment, QI being quality improvement, we want to do that. We want to be able to improve our abilities as paramedics to make certain that we're doing the best possible patient care. And if you don't document well, then we don't know what you did or didn't do, and therefore we can't help you improve and you're simply harming your future patients all right so know that we got to check our trucks and blah 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 make sure all that's good cool what is a sepsis what is a sepsis preventing contamination yeah in the most simple sense it is without sepsis a meaning without and sepsis you know, so a sepsis is without sepsis. What is sepsis? Sepsis is an infection. Now we know, we talk about the diagnosis of sepsis being a very uh, widespread um, systemic infection, general, like a blood inf an infection in the blood, but um, it's caused by contamination. So it, we use the term asepsis in EMS because we are not able to create a sterile field. We are not able to create a sterile environment. Uh, we can use sterile equipment. We can use antiseptics. We can use disinfectants um, and such like that. But we cannot maintain a sterile environment. As soon as we open a sterile package, that product is no longer sterile. Unlike in the ER, excuse me, the OR, when a sterile package is opened and the item is placed on the sterile field that item is still considered sterile until it comes in contact with the patient's body or the um uh the physician's uh hand you know that had been touching the body you know there's a lot of rules on maintaining sterility and that entire environment is considered sterile so we can't do that so we're not going to try to claim oh we want sterility in the ambulance no, not working so we practice asepsis which is without infection the least amount of infection and contamination possible
Um, what's the difference between an antiseptic and a disinfectant? Anybody? I hear somebody now. Yep. Yes, and which is which? Very good. Disinfectants are for inanimate objects, non-organics. They kill organics. So if you used a disinfectant on human tissue, it would cause harm to the human tissue. The antiseptic, like, and you think about the difference there between like a chlor, um, the um, sanit sanitizing wipes versus a chlor prep or a uh, alcohol prep or whatever. Alcohol preps, chlor preps, they're okay to use on the human body, but sanitizing wipes are not. Hey, uh, Noonan, you guys' camera looks like it's fogged or something like that. Whew, no. no, no, not helping. Gotcha. gotcha cool sounds good all right so clean versus sterile you know we understand clean like when we're doing med admins we want to be as careful as possible with our needles with our meds you open the ampule you don't touch the top you put the needle in it tap the needle again or just uh, throw it away depending on the scenario that you're in if you're gonna um start an iv you clean and prep the site but then you don't touch it again you don't uncap the catheter until you're about to insert it you do not uh, set a uh, open catheter down on a bench on the floor on the patient on the counter um keep it clean because if you don't you're placing you're potentially placing contamination bacterial whatever eat directly into that patient's bloodstream and that can create a pretty significant infection rather quickly so we uh, so that's why we really do need to uh, put some careful consideration into this um yeah, we're not going to do all the whole sterile technique right we just don't have the ability to do that all right so, um, yeah, I think we got that. All right, we got that. All right, so once we have contaminated needles, they should go directly into the sharps box. I know maybe some departments use a pro procedure, let's say start an IV and there's um, blood in the IV catheter, using that blood to check a blood sugar or something like that. Well, that's not that, that may be common practice, that's not recommended practice because of the risk of sticking yourself uh, and spreading contaminated potentially contaminated blood we teach it treat everyone's bl body fluid all body fluids as if they're contaminated um in some way shape or form if you stick yourself you go to pull a needle out uh to um, drop some medication and you stick your hand instead of the ampule or the vial um does that count as an exposure it's a needle stick but is it an exposure No, it's not an exposure because that is a clean needle. That needle has not touched anyone else. But if that needle were then to go into the ampule or into the patient, you have now contaminated that with your blood. You're making a, a dirty needle stick. So you would have, even if it was an accidental needle stick on you, on a clean needle, you have to replace the needle, get a different needle. Um, anytime you use a needle, it should go directly into the sharps box. Uh, your um, method of 
uh, capping like safety needles and all that should require one hand. You should not have to use your other hand to cap it or safety it. Um, you should maybe use it a hard surface or something along those lines. Um, but that's uh, that's how those are designed. Uh, years ago, um, ambulances were called meat wagons. You've probably heard that term before, and that was that came from the smell in the back of the ambulance. Ambulances smelled like a meat locker. They smelled like a slaughterhouse. And there were, that was determined, it was finally figured out that the reason for that was people would take the needles after starting an IV or giving a med or something like that because they weren't self-locking, self-capping um, safety needles. And they'd stick them straight down into the bench. It's a great idea, right? You've taken the sharp needle, you've covered it up, you stuck it in the bench cushion, problem solved. It's not gonna stick anybody. Uh, also, there was no standard for requiring sharps boxes in the ambulances, so a lot of departments did not provide them. And um, then the EMT could uh, clean it all up when they got to the hospital and put the sharps in the, in the box. So it was like, oh yeah, this spot on the bench, that's our needle spot, like you always, uh, you get a, a needle, you stick it there, that way we know where to look for it. That's why you didn't have sharps floating around. Well, the blood that was inside those catheters, inside the, or not catheters, but those um, uh, needles, would drain into the bench and rot and stay there. And that's where the smell would come from, was that, um, that blood in the bench. So, yeah, that, those are things that we don't do anymore. Um, and uh, we should try to avoid that kind of stuff. So there we go, we're straight into the sharps box. Um, they're a handy tool. Um, normally they're too big, in my opinion, to throw into your jump bag. Even the ones that are considered small, um, I like some other styles. Let me show you one. So this is the type of um, sharps box right here. Something like this is what we often see, one quart or one pint sharps boxes in our jump bags. They have a, you know, they have their place, but in my opinion, they're often too large for our sharps bags, or I mean our jump bags. This is the type that I think we should use more cons uh, consistently. These are carriers. These are not um, necessarily considered like a final sharp box. you can actually seal it so it is but the cool benefit of that is if you have this in your jump bag you can carry it back to your truck pop it open without risking opening you know, or harming yourself and dump its contents into your larger sharps bin and you know like something like that you might have in the back of your truck and then continue to use that but it also has a little tab on it that you could um fold over plug in there and secure permanently and now that is a closed and safetyed sharps box so um there's lots of options i've worked places where we carried these they're super cool they're all fancy and all that but again they just take up so much room in our drug box or our um, jump bags that you know is what it is so uh, I think there's just different options out there, um, and if we don't bring these up to our admin, they won't know about our issues or concerns. So, you know, they're like, hey, any suggestions, any thoughts? Yeah, let's try a different sharps box or something. So, um, we already talked about body fluid composition. Um, all right. Um, 
fluid electrolytes. I think I covered all this stuff in the other video that you guys already watched, so I'm not going to go too far into this, although when it comes to fluid administrations, these are concerns. So here you have an example of overhydration, patient who has too much fluid, third spacing, resulting in edema, and um, other signs and symptoms related to it. And then that can also come from administration of IV fluids in an uncontrolled manner. So you've given excessive IV fluids, or perhaps the patients drank an excessive amount of water or something like that, and it's led to this overhydration state and third spacing of fluids. So, um, we're not going to get into how to necessarily uh, shift fluids very much. There, It is possible to do that, whether you're using a hyper or a hypotonic solution. A hypertonic solution is great when your patient is overhydrated and their kidneys are functioning, but if their kidneys don't function, it won't. Uh, hypotonic solutions are helpful for dehydration, but the generally your concern with that is it's going to result in a fast or, or a too rapid of a fluid shift into their cells uh, and with the brain and blood cells it's very dangerous so a lot of times dehydration is treated with isotonic fluids and electrolyte replacements so what's going to cause um alterations of electrolytes so you can see there um we've kind of mentioned some of these before um to electrolyte issues. Now here's a cool breakdown explaining the differences between what your normal blood plasma levels are and what is present in our typical fluids. So our normal sodium levels in our blood is 135 to 145. 0.9% sodium chloride, excuse me, has 154. Um, I think this, yeah, milli equivalents of sodium in it. Um, it also has 154 chloride, but yeah. Notice that our body, our plasma has three and a half to five potassium, eight and to ten and a half calcium. It's another 15, um, and then one and a half to two and a half magnesium. Whereas sodium chloride doesn't have any of that, and that's why even at 154. It's above the 145 of our plasma. It's still isotonic because it doesn't have those other electrolytes as well. But you can see 3% 3, 3 sodium chloride or the lactated ringers, 130 plus 109 chloride, and then four of potassium and three of calcium. So what does LR have? It's got potassium and calcium with less sodium. That's one of the reasons uh, lactated ringers is garnering a lot of attention and some departments and a lot of doctors prefer lactated ringers, especially in the shock patients because they wanna replace both the calcium and potassium as well, not just the sodium. So I think we'll see uh, lactated ringers, uh, LR, as a more common fluid replacement in the future. All right, so we're still talking about crystalloids, though. These are just fluids that will um, have electrolytes in them. They do not carry oxygen. They are not blood replacement. They are just simply volume replacement. And once we administer these fluids and the electrolytes are metabolized, well, then the fluid is still going to shift out of the vascular space into the cellular and interstitial spaces. Um, and this is why we use a three to one replacement, right? What that means is for every milliliter of fluid loss or blood loss, you need three milliliters of crystalloid isotonic solution replacement. So if a patient loses one liter of blood, they're going to need three liters of fluid to replace that volume because two thirds of the fluids of the crystalloids that we give our patients will shift out of the bloodstream within 20 minutes of administration. So if you think about it, you know, you start fluids in the field, you get to the trauma center, basically two thirds of whatever you gave has already left their bloodstream and is in interstitial and intracellular spaces. 
Now, it might be needed there. That's that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's where our fluid replacements are so, uh, or why fluid replacement numbers can often be so large. But, you know, doesn't carry oxygen, definitely some um, drawbacks to it. Um, colloids are interesting. They're a newer concept. They are not necessarily effective in the pre-hospital environment, be, mostly due to their cost and the require what's required to store them. They tend to have rather short shelf lives and things like that. And if given wrong, can cause huge, pro huge problems. Colloids more correctly mimic plasma in that it has non-dissolvable molecules like albumin or um, uh, basically other protein structures and such in it. I've already kind of talked about this a few times. Remember, if the fluid is a hypertonic, it will cause the cells to shrink because it pulls water out of them. They have a high concentration, higher than intracellular, so they pull the water out of the cells in, short, in order to uh, balance them. A isotonic should cause a limited fluid shift as overall volume there's not a lot of change and then a hypotonic solution will push water it's a very dilute solution will push fluid into the cells causing the cells to swell so hyper shrink hypo swell so, um yeah, this one's a little bit confusing. We don't normally think of it in pre-hospital or use it pre-hospital. The D50, or excuse me, the D5W. This is very common in hospital, extremely frequently used. But it is only considered isotonic when it is in the bag. Once the D5W is administered, the sugar is metabolized. The dextrose is going to be metabolized out of it. And now you're just giving the patient water. Now they just have a whole lot of water in their bloodstream. And that is where the, uh, no, I mean, blood, is, plasma is predominantly water. It's like plasma is like 96 water or something. So it's fine. But a lot of that water will shift into the cells as a hypotonic solution. And so we consider it isotonic in the bag, but once it enters the body, it's hypotonic. Yep, I already covered all of that. Um, yeah, whole blood, uh, partial blood, packed red blood cells, um, stuff like that. They're great. So far, there really isn't an effective synthetic blood substitute, uh, synthetic oxygen carrying, something with oxygen carrying capacity. Um, any substitutes that they've tried have either um, are extremely expensive or have a very limited shelf life again. So. Make something that's really uh, useful like that, and you'll probably be a billionaire. All right, so how are we going to give? All right, so that's kind of a review of the fluids. Now let's talk about IV administration specifically. Um, but I'm going to take a quick break before we do that. So IVs, I'm not going to try to teach you or discuss how to start an IV or, you know, like the technique of starting an IV per se over Zoom. That is not going to be effective. We will be doing that on Friday. Uh, ideally, people in your group that know how to do it have already been helping you figure it out and have spent some time with you. Uh, but it is not going to be effective for me to try to uh, talk you through that uh, process right now. But there are some theories um, that I want, some concepts that I want to go over. And for those of you that are I's and A's already starting IVs, this is a really helpful review because this is one of the biggest areas of uh, healthcare provider uh, or healthcare acquired infections in the um, pre-hospital environment. Very, very few other things create as much infection as IVs or anything, really nothing. So, all right. So, you know, obviously we're sticking um, 
medical equipment into a patient's inside their body into their vein that means it's coming direct contact with the water excuse me with the blood that's going into their heart going throughout their whole body so it's very important that we keep everything clean i have seen some of the most horrendous things happen in the past and i'm not saying they were trying to do it or even trying to be irresponsible or whatever it's, things have happened uh, and so you've got to ask yourself is this the right time the right place the right patient do i need to be starting this iv right now or can i wait um and if you have to do it right then what are your um what are your uh safeties that you're putting in place to ensure that you're going to have good success do you have enough light do you have enough um cleanliness uh ways to clean it is it going to stay clean you know that kind of stuff so here's some of your stuff that you would need um can read right standard equipment um your tape should be torn and ready before you get started so you're not having to wait. Um, right. So when we're picking a solution, uh, you want to think about how much fluid, well, which fluid you're going to do. Is it going to be LR? Is it going to be normal saline, normal, um, normal sol, or something like that? Um, or, um, and then how much fluid are you going to give? Uh, you're, I don't know what this is. Hang on. All right, sorry, fire department. Okay, um, what I was saying is it used to be that when our patients got an IV, we automatically gave a bag, a thousand bag of fluids. I mean, that was pretty standard practice. You start an IV, you hang a thousand bag, and you start running it uh, TKO. Well, that's an unnecessary use of fluids. Not every patient is dehydrated, needs a thousand bag. In fact, a lot some departments have gone to not stocking thousand bags and only stocking five hundreds in order to reduce the risk of excessive fluid administration and things like that. Um, sometimes your patient may only be receiving a small amount of fluids, and so the two fifty bag might work. But typically, two fifties are going to be used for mixing medications in. So then we have our micros and our macro drips, all right? So what this is talking about is the size of the hole in comparison to a milliliter. And when we're talking about the size of the hole, we have, you can see in the clearly in the picture on the right, or looking at it, you see that large plastic hole with a drip of water coming out of it, and I went too far. But you cannot see it very well in the one on the left because a um, glare. So let's... Uh, all right um micro drip sets lots of different options out here there we go um so this gives an idea. So when you have a mic macro drip set, you have this larger hole here versus a very small hole. And the smaller holes are generally like a metal uh, tube, like an IV catheter. And what we're talking about is the size of the drop of water that comes out of the hole. And this is based on the surface tension of water, how it's able to hold together and such like that. A macro drip, um, or excuse me, let's start with a micro. The micro drip is going to have 60 drops per milliliter. 60 of these little drops coming out of that metal tube equals one milliliter. And that is a very standard concentrate of standard measurement. It's predictable. It's designed that way. So any micro drip set will have 60 drops per milliliter. That's not a time, that's per milliliter. That way, you know, when you're measuring your fluid drip rate, you can say, oh, I want to give one milliliter a minute. Well, I do one drop per second. And that's how the drip set works. The macro drip set can be a various a variation of numbers, or a variety, I should say, a variety of numbers. It could be 10, 12, 15, or 20. I haven't really seen anything beyond that, um, but the drip sets on those are, um, and that's how many drops per milliliter. 10 is probably one of the most common sizes out there, 10 to 15 drops um, sets. Those will have a... Um, 
meaning a much larger hole, only 10 drops in order uh, to make one milliliter of fluid. So that's what we're talking about there. Now in our uh, PowerPoint, back, we have another type of fluid uh, drip set, and this is blood tubing. We don't see blood tubing sets very often, um, because the uh, well, we're not typically pres um, administering blood products in the field. A uh, blood tubing. Let me uh, go back to Google again for you for this. Um, All right, so a blood tubing set, as you can see here, um, brief. Why is it all got to be so snarl? Here we go. This is what I'm looking for. So a lot of your blood tubing are gonna look like this, where they have two connections, two spikes to be able to connect to two bags at the same time. One of those is gonna be the blood product, the other is going to be saline. And that way, as it mixes together, the um, it dilutes the blood product out and prevents clotting and such like that. That is what this, um, chamber here is now this is a single port with a with just a drip chamber there not exactly the same thing uh, as what we we're seeing but uh design you know systems like this where you have the two cha two spikes and then a filter chamber here's another example of a filter chamber this is a very common one that we see a lot these days these systems are are these filter chambers are intended to prevent the uh passage of clots into the patient. So any clot that formed in the blood in the bag or the tube will get caught in that filter and then uh, not go into the patient's uh, vasculature. So here's another example of the um, blood tubing or Y type blood tubing. Right. All right, the other system that our PowerPoint discusses is the uh, Volutrol. Let me show you that one real quick. Um, all right, so the Volutrols will come in a number of different designs uh, and styles. You might have the burette sets, you have, um, but basically they're designed to control the amount of fluid that's going to be given to the patient at a time. Um, one of my f uh, preferred methods for administering fluids to pediatrics is using one of these. We call this a burette set, um, sometimes referred to as a volutrol. It might be micro, may oh my God might be micro or typically it's micro but also maybe a macro drip but uh, this is about 150 milliliter volume you would spike a normal bag of fluids right here saline lr whatever d5 uh, d10 um d5 whatever it happened to be spike it there and then you would use this for really little pediatrics um who are getting a very small amount of fluid something less than 150 milliliters these small babies even if you're trying if they're dehydrated and you're trying to do a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus if you were to give them too much fluid even by 20 to 30 um milliliters it could be harmful to that um that baby so what you want to do is you would say oh we need to give 60 milliliters of fluid to this patient well you would fill your volutrol or your burette set that's the same same different name same system you would fill it to 60 milliliters 
lock off your bag and then adjust your flow rate here in your drip, drip chamber to whatever the infusion rate's supposed to be using, you know, that, that's your uh, control clamp there. And then that will uh, administer only that 60 milliliters. It will not continue to infuse fluids after that 60 milliliters is gone. So therefore you don't risk forgetting to turn the fluids off and overhydrating your patient. We don't use this much for adults because frankly, they're not as sensitive to fluid overload as pediatrics are. Um, and so it's not near as big of a concern, but it can, but babies, it can be a real big issue. And so you would use the Volutrol or the Burette set. Now, another option would be the um, Dialaflow sets. They come in different designs. Uh, you might have something that looks like this connected to the, in line with your fluids. You know, here, here it is in a line set up. And you can see that you just adjust that to, you know, the number 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 um, drops per minute is what that's set at. You would, um, this is generally going to be part of a uh, micro drip set of some sort. And then it's going to control so that you don't have to set the adjustment to determine how fluid it is. The problem with this is it's um, assuming that you have a free flowing line. If you have a kinked tubing, if you have um, a bad IV site or positional IV catheter or whatever, these types of um, uh, equipment aren't, are no longer as accurate. Um, Here's the other one. Very and see a lot more of um there. So this is another style, same concept, just a slightly different style valve. And there, um, instead of having to eyeball your drip chamber to adjust your drip rate, you set it with this. Again, I don't find them to be accurate because they are dependent on a uh, consistently free flowing IV site and with you know no obstructions. So they have they definitely have their limitations. But those are some of the concepts that you're going to see, or some of the tubing types that you will um, run into when we're trying to dis uh, select IV tubing. Most of the time, we're going to be doing simple drip chamber, micro, and macro drip sets. Uh, occasionally, you might get into a world of um, critical care where your department stocks your trucks with uh, IV pumps, uh, med pumps. Uh, sometimes they're even as simple as a syringe pump where you would draw up a medication into a syringe and then the pump would equip or um, slowly administer that medication. A lot of your syringe pumps you see are for patient um, administered analgesics um, where the patient pushes a button, gives himself a dose of medication. You see, see that a lot. Um, but in the pre-hospital environment, folks that do a lot of interfacility transports will often stock their own pumps. Um, but other than that, in the interfacility transport world, you are likely to run into a lot of scenarios where you're transporting patient on multiple med pumps and those med pumps are going to be loaned to you from the trans, uh, transferring facility and then you just have to return them to the tr um, transferring facility after dropping the patient off. Yeah, it has its um, issues, it, it has its problems um, because now you have to return to that same location but it um it beats trying to set up your own meds and your own pumps be and worrying about whether or not the meds are um com excuse me your drip sets are compatible with their pumps and that kind of stuff and then sometimes 
you may not carry the same meds and so you don't have them available. So that's why we typically end up borrowing med uh, pumps, taking them on loan and then returning them. So, um, all right, choosing an IV access site. Well, if you're EMS or a firefighter, then the only place you know how to start an IV is in the AC. I know that that's where people uh, do blood draws. Phlebotomists do flood blood draws there all the time. Um, it's, it's not wrong. Like, it is good access. It's fast access um and it tends to be uh, a very easy site to get uh, when i say fast i mean it's a large vein that has rapid fluid um capacity it, it can receive a lot of fluid is it the best site? I don't think so. I think when we have critical patients uh, in emergent situations, um, it can it, it's a very good choice. You know, your traumas, your major medicals, and things like that. You need fluids. That's a really a good site to have. I think you should use it. However, if you know the patient is not going to need a significant quantities of fluid and is likely going to have this IV in place for a little while. I don't think that the IV site or the AC site is the best site because it's very positional. That patient starts moving their arm, they crimp off the catheter, their fluid rate's not going to flow. We're not using pumps that'll tell us that. The um, we're just the patient's just not going to receive that flow anymore. And if this is a medication, then they're not getting that dose. If it's like a continuous infusion or something, so that's causing huge issues. So we should always choose to administer fluid or excuse me establish our ivs as far away from uh or you know as distal as possible that way if there's something that goes wrong on that site then we can always move more proximal but we start distal and then we move proximal um back of the hand side of the wrist these are really good locations you want to think where is it going to be comfortable for the patient in the long term maybe the back of the hand or the wrist hurts a little bit more to start it there but it's going to hurt a lot less there in the long run because it's not going to move and pinch every single time they move their arm so consider that when you're trying to pick your iv sites also not every patient needs an 18 gauge iv 20 gauge ivs are perfectly adequate in fact um in most hospital situations, a 20 gauge is considered a large bore catheter. I'm like, whatever. But when I go in there, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, we got a 22. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> um, but anyway, different world, you know, a 22 IV catheter that flows is better than a 20 gauge that blew. Or, you know, you don't know we're not always given massive amounts of fluids so we just need an iv that will work so uh consider the options and remember this when you're looking for veins your veins are very there are some locations on the body where they are consistently in the same place veins will move not every person's the same but there are a few areas where we know they're going to be acs you're always going to have one here and one over here you're always going to have one right here on the side of the wrist right there uh below at the base of the thumb um we often have veins on the top of the hand don't necessarily know exactly they will vary somewhat there um but that side of the wrist this is probably my favorite location for ivs because if we start in that vein there it's consistently there it's easy to find even if you can't see it and then it doesn't prevent them from moving their wrist around there's very little irritation in the long run there so uh, with a patient like this, somewhere in the middle of the arm would be really handy uh, because it's not going to cause any irritation. But, you know, you think about how that's going to work. If I'm dealing with a seizure patient, um, 
I'm probably going to be picky and stay away from uh, like their AC because that's going to um, crimp off if they start to seize again. Whereas maybe a paralysis patient, a uh, you know a patient with a stroke, that they're not going to be moving that arm, so I don't have to worry about them cramp, uh, crimping off that uh, vein. So what does a what does a uh, um, vein feel like compared to a tendon? Veins are spongy. When you push them, they bounce, they compress, and then re rebound. Whereas a an artery, or excuse me, not artery, a tendon or a ligament will be very firm when you've extended it and when you uh, contract and all that, and it will not move. You will not feel compression. It's feel very hard uh, compared to a vein. So that's one good way to check it. Also, you won't feel a pulse on a vein. The arteries will have the pulse. Can we start IVs in a foot? Yes, you can. Should you start an IV in the foot on a diabetic patient? Probably not. Can you? Yes. But remember, diabetes has a major effect on the patient's capillary beds, the microvascular. We're not starting IVs in there. We're starting IVs in the veins. So not even the venules, but the veins. So it's already past the area where the diabetic damage, the, neuro the um, vascular uh, um, damage has happened from the di from the high blood sugars. So your patient should have good flow there, but they may not. The bigger, the, another concern related to that though, is if they have decreased flow through their uh, distal extremities and in their capillaries, you may have a harder time getting that patient to heal. And so we don't want to um, cause tissue damage in those extremities where they have poor blood flow if they're going to have a limited ability to heal. So be aware of that, uh, avoid those as much as possible. On the non-diabetic patients, your feet, um, legs, there's nothing wrong with starting an IV there, but um, just be cautious in the diabetic patient. Again, it's still better than no vein if you can, if that's all you have available. <laughs> Back of the hand is a great option. Tends to be a little bit more painful, um, but it's a really great option for starting an IV. All right. Um, Most of our catheters are gonna be over the needle catheters. We really don't see the intracatheters. These are where the needles on the outside, like this just thing that we deal with much. Those are like your um, central lines and such like that. We're not, we don't do those in the pre-hospital world. So, um, So always start distal. That way, if you do have a failed attempt, you can go more proximal to the patient, your first attempt in the AC. When you're starting the IV, the bevel needs to be up. Um, to support this and stabilize the tissue. It's so great that we get to practice on each other who are young, healthy, um, adequate uh, body fat and such like that versus starting them on the extremely dehydrated, the extremely old, the extremely obese and all the other scenarios that we run, to and run into in EMS. It's, I, I love it how the guys uh, come back from the military. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm great at starting IVs. And I'm like, yeah, you're great at starting IVs on 19-year-old boys who have, like, a 3% body fat and peak physical condition. Like, that's who you're great at starting IVs on. Welcome to the real world. Your patient weighs 300 pounds and is fluid overloaded and has 30 comorbidities. 
Good luck. All right, going to move through this. Don't really need to. Um, again, this is what we're going to talk about in person. Not going to try to explain this over uh, Zoom. Uh, angle, yeah. Um, there are methods of using ultrasounds uh, to... Um, how do I say this? Basically, what the ultrasound does is creates a two-dimensional picture of the tissue where the vein is. And some of them will now use even uh, do three-dimensional. And by two-dimensional, it might illuminate like a screen across the arm or, or the area. And so the, the vein lights up. And then others, they use an actual, they use a transducer that creates a two-dimensional cross-section of the tissue underneath. So you can see where the vein is. Um, show you a picture of that. Um, all right, so here are examples. You can see here they use this little transducer. It has a couple of different uh, directions. Here you can see the cross section showing the circle vein right there. Here showing the vein in a lateral um, placement. You see the length of the vein and the catheter coming into the vein. So um, those are a couple of different views of it. There's a different type of ultrasound. So basically showing how you can get to the vein with a ultrasound. Now, you would be able to recognize the difference between the vein and the artery based on the pulsation and the movement of the artery. Uh, this is a newer design where it causes the blood to appear red, so it makes it very evident where the um, blood is and uh, makes cannulation that much easier. So those are some examples of how ultrasounds can be used. We see this in the pre-hospital environment, or excuse me, in the hospital environment. We do not frequently see this in the pre-hospital environment. So um, not, uh, you know, just kind of pointing it out, so suggesting it, or, in or introducing it, I should say. There you go. Um, ultrasounds. All right, once we've gotten the IV established, it is very important to secure it. This is kind of an old way of doing it before we had tegaderms. Uh, it's a very effective way. It works really well to secure that line, putting the tape across the catheter and um, V uh, folding it and Ving it back, um, then taping down the tubing. The tubing should be taped down in a loop like that in order to basically create a shock absorber so that if something pulls the cath uh, pulls on the uh, tubing line it has a little bit of room to be taken up without um, yanking the catheter out instantly um, anytime you have to change the bag you can use the same tubing you can use um, you just want to make certain that the spike does not touch anything between removing it from the empty bag and placing it in the full bag. Removing the IV line. Pretty straightforward. Take two by twos or four by fours, fold it up, place it on top of the catheter. Um, and then kind of like when you're taking a Band-Aid off, you just, you just do it. You don't pull it out slow, place pressure at the insertion site, and then jerk that uh, IV catheter out really fast and get it over with. Um, some f Sometimes you, uh, what it's saying is don't remove the cut. Uh, cath tubing from the hub if you have an INT cap or saline lock or whatever that yeah that gets left on the catheter but if the and if the tubing is connected to that INT cap or the saline lock then you can remove the tubing you don't have to leave it connected but if you um, that's assuming that uh, you did not have an INT cap um, connected 
And, you know, for years, we didn't have INT caps. That wasn't a thing. You would start the IV and connect your IV tubing directly to the hub of the catheter. Just the way it went. Once you've removed the catheter, though, you want to play, apply pressure for a few minutes to that site and then tape it down securely. This will help prevent bruising and reduce the discomfort of that area afterwards. Uh, when I first started in EMS, we called these HEPLOCs because they were filled with heparin. They actually would uh, pre-fill this entire a tube with heparin in order to prevent clotting. And then, um, yep. Mm -hmm. Hot would tear the skin. Um, and what are they suggesting using instead? No, um, using a, using gauze of some sort is still standard practice and recommended method for um, securing an IV catheter. I mean, securing a site once the IV catheter has been removed. Um, any wound has the ability to bleed. And, you know, and if you have, like, some places might use a non-stick bandage, like a Band-Aid or whatever, and that could work. But um, you shouldn't have that quantity of um, blood. There shouldn't be that much blood coming out that the 4 by 4 is going to... Uh, Act to and you would have to have some extremely fragile tissue for the clot to stick to the skin that aggressively right uh, more aggressively more securely than the skin sticks to the skin right so a scab will often tear loose of the skin without tearing the skin so it might start bleeding again, but the intention is you put the pressure on first, move the catheter, and then apply pressure to the site through the four by four, and that should prevent the bleeding from coming out of the skin and just uh, remain in that tissue. And so um, I recommend the use of the four by four. Uh, everything I've read as far as best practice and standards of practice is still using gauze or a, a cotton ball or something like that on the tissue. Um, if you have a person who has a very fragile skin, then you, could be a concern there, but in that case, you would have a lot of issues with any form of adhesive. Uh, and so you may just have to hold direct pressure for a while with um, like your gloved hand or something. But uh, that would be a lot of just direct um, pressure. Um, is that something you've seen as a, like a recommended protocol? Was it a tampon? Was he telling you to use tampons? Because there's medics out there that recommend the use of tampons for gunshot wounds, and frankly, buddy, that's not helping anybody. Except for maybe... Um, yeah, whatever the tampon company is. Johnson & Johnson. All right, so saline locks used to, well, when they were hep locks, they were full of heparin, and so you had to withdraw the heparin and waste it um, after, uh, before you could access the port. Uh, otherwise, you'd be dosing the patient with an anticoagulant, and that's not helpful. Uh, then they became saline locks. Um, they were really useful that way. I thought they were great. Now we're using just the cap itself, and it's the catheter there's no reason to keep it um locked up uh or with that uh additional extension set on it so 
EJs. EJs can be used. Remember, the blood in an EJ and the vasculature of the EJ is distal to the brain. All right. So the brain, the blood has entered the brain. It is leaving the brain and it is going. So it's past the brain. It's going back to the heart. So if you create an issue here in the EJ, let's say it blows, right? And you don't have uh, an IV there anymore. You're not cutting off circulation to the brain. Right, your your the body has two external jugulars and two internal jugulars. So damaging even both external jugulars, while it may create a reduction in blood flow out of the brain, it's not going to kill the patient. Should we do it? No, no, you shouldn't cavalierly blow two EJs, but. It's not going to kill the patient if the EJ blows. The big concern with EJs is pulmonary embolisms. EJs are very close to the chest, right? And whenever the patient takes a breath, creating that negative pr pressure in the thoracic cavity, it, it, blood is pulled into the chest as well. So if you've established an EJ IV catheter, and then that patient takes a deep breath and that catheter is not um, occluded and secured, air can get pulled into that catheter and or through that catheter into their bloodstream and they could take um, a significant portion of their chest volume pulled, into, pulled in as air. Um, and then if they do that a few times, it could be enough air to create a pulmonary embolism, you know, an air gas embolism in their lungs. So that's the big concern with an EJ. Uh, a lot of places won't let you do it. Um, in fact, there was a scenario uh, about 10 years ago in FDNY, New York City Fire Department, where they had to stop doing EJs in the field because people kept causing pneumothoraxes. Now, on the world, you ask, well, they had rather poor um, identification of the location of the EJ, as well as they were using chest decompression needles. So like three and a half inch long 16 gauge IV catheters, and they would insert uh, them so deep that it would pop the lung. I mean, there are so many other things that they could be hitting and damaging with subclavian arteries, subclavian veins, like you have a lot of problems there. Um, but if you're using a standard inch and a half, um, 20 gauge or 18 gauge IV catheter, you're really not going to have any risks, any significant risk with the EJ. Just because it's an EJ doesn't mean it needs a 16 or a 14 gauge IV. Like, don't be ridiculous. Um, although it should not be your first line um, option. It is an option. If you're going to start an EJ, you want to lay the patient supine or, if possible, low, their head lower um, and their legs elevated. And, um, kind of like that uh, Trendelenburg uh, to try to get as much blood flow into that EJ and a bulging of that EJ as possible. So there's an example there. Um, it's really hard to see the angle at which that patient's head is. Um, I don't know how this person intends to start an IV. I mean, I know those are old school latex gloves, not uh, this new crappy nitrile stuff, but that glove looks way too loose. In I would not be able to feel anything with a glove that loose. Um, really want that glove to fit tight so that you, as you're feeling, uh, palpating the vein and all that it clearly evident what you're touching and you could if necessary let's say this isn't bulging that um, significantly you could use a finger at the base of the neck to um, apply pressure to the EJ and cause the EJ to engorge with blood All right, catheters, blah, blah, blah. At all the different sizes. Look at those in person next week. Um, pediatric, you might need an, a light. Again, we're not gonna get into this too detailed. Here you can see very close veins, right? I mean, varicose veins. 
if you uh, start these IVs, um, you could result in large hematomas under the skin because these are uh, veins that already have poor circulation. That's why they're um, so evident like that. And that could result in um, just the fluid not flowing out of that area, out of that tissue properly, and then building up in the tissue, creating those hematomas. Uh, most of your irritation related to IVs is going to be based on your flu, uh, flow rate, giving too much fluid or giving the fluid too fast. Um, here's some recommendations on how to check for flow rate. A lot of times it's the patient moving their arm and the catheter being pinched off or coming up against a internal valve. There's little valves in all of the veins that prevent backflow because the blood's trying to move back to the heart and it doesn't want it going backwards. But if you are too close to one of those valves, it will reduce the uh, fluid, um, your, your rate of fluid administration. All right, so let's talk a little about some of the failures and some of the uh, damage or irritation that's created as a result of um, IVs. So infiltration is one of the big ones. This is when the catheter is no longer in the vein. It could be that you inserted it into the vein and then it passed through the other side and or the vein exploded, uh, fell apart. We call that the vein blue or the, the movement of the patient caused the vein to back out and withdraw from vein, the catheter to withdraw from the vein. These are all options there. Um, what you'll see is a hematoma forming under the skin and consistent with the flow of fluid. Now you may also see it with just blood uh, forming if the patient's blood pressure is particularly high or something like that. Um, sometimes if you've had that happen once on a patient, uh, if you have to make another attempt at an IV, don't use a tourniquet because that would result in that higher pressure. So if the patient has a real high blood pressure and their veins are fragile and blowing as soon as you uh, touch them with the IV catheter, then you can go ahead and just not use the tourniquet and use your finger to occlude the vein enough to see where it is and then establish the uh, cannula, um, the IV, um, establish the IV without uh, allowing it to uh, blow. It can work, it's kind of a trick, um, yeah. All right, um, always make certain that your fluid is clear. It's the appropriate fluid. I've talked before about uh, mistaking something like a medication, like lidocaine for a bag of fluid or ringers or whatever. Uh, make certain that the bag is a at a high enough level above the IV site that there's enough gravity to flow the fluid in. If there isn't, if the patient's blood pressure is too high, then it is possible that the fluid will um, back or excuse me the blood will back up into the IV tubing um, and then it could clot off the tubing and ruin the uh, tubing set um, yeah so. oh we already went through all this okay so if you have uh, just uh, infiltration. If the vein blows and the IV site is infiltrating, uh, you've lost the IV site, then stop the IV flow immediately. Um, it's uh, once you do that, you want to withdraw the catheter, same as any other catheter, put good pressure on it. Uh, you want to apply the pressure in that general area to help res uh, reduce the size of that hematoma. But um, it is not normally recommended that you wrap all the way around the extremity. There's some debate on this. It's very common for you to go to like give blood or whatever, or get, have um, blood tests done, and they use that K-Flex um, elastic bandage, uh, self-adhesive bandage, wrap it all the way around your arm. It can be useful. Um, it just can't be left on there for a long time. And you, you don't want the uh you don't want to be creating some form of tourniquet with it um 
I've had a lot of patients due to their um, clamminess or sweating or their skin condition or whatever, that tape would not stick at all. And the only way to secure that and keep it from bleeding was to wrap the tape all the way around on itself and create that band. Again, it can work as long, uh, you know, for the 10, 15 minutes it takes for clotting to happen. But then after that, it needs to be removed so it's not causing a backflow of fluid, of blood. You don't want to be tourniqueting that extremity off. All right, when you have an occlusion, when the, there's a blockage in the vein or the catheter, it's no longer flowing adequately, you may need to reposition the catheter, pull a little back tension, a little bit of uh, traction on it, and see if that improves. It's like I said, it, maybe the catheter is up against a valve, or it could have started to clot off, and so you need to just flush it with um, some pressure. You know, put a flush on it, syringe, push some pressure through it, open that back up and improve flow. Some of your options there. All right. Um, don't, when you have an occluded line, you may need to discontinue it. It may no longer be useful. It may have blown, and then you have to start a new line. I recommend um, getting a new IV before removing the old one um, in almost all circumstances. Uh, unless it's blown and swelling up significantly. Uh, I always recommend getting a new IV first um, or a new site established before you discontinue the old site. All right, so I've already mentioned this. Had, uh, too rapid of influ um, infusion results in vein irritation. Slow it down. Occasionally, if it starts to turn red, you start having a local site reaction to the IV. There may be contamination on the tubing or on in the fluids that's causing the irritation. In that case, you want to um, disconnect the tubing, stop the flow rate, disconnect the tubing, leave the catheter in place, and then save that in, uh, equipment in a bag so that it's not going to be further contaminated. Uh, and then what it'll be done is it'll be sent to the lab to see if they can find out what was in it, how did it get contaminated, why why did it cause irritation. And then you get a new IV started on another, on another extremity, another location. Again, you could be dealing with something that turns into a hemolytic reaction or an anaphylactic reaction or something, in which case you have to have access. I would not recommend removing the actual catheter. You can disconnect the tubing, but I wouldn't recommend moving, removing the catheter until you have a new one established. That way, if it really hits the fan and you really got to take... Uh, got, uh, to get fluids or medication on board, you still have access on that patient. But again, you would remove the tubing and the fluid bag and all that, and you would use something totally different. That way, you're not whatever's in that bag isn't continued to ir continuing to irritate the patient. All right, so this is inflammation that leads to an actual infection. It's a much more significant um, issue. Uh, thrombophlebitis it's very um, right it's really not that common of a scenario uh, but generally it's because we caused um, the infection we weren't using aseptic technique so there's an example of a hematoma from a blown IV that did not get uh, properly secured and to prevent bleeding afterwards and that continued to bleed. All right, um, ner or nerves and tendons hurt like holy crap. If you touch them with an IV catheter, you generally will know very quickly because the pain will, um, it'll not just be local to the site of insertion. They'll feel the pain shoot up their arm or something like that. So definitely you'll know then when it happens. Arterial punctures, I've done this before, not intentionally, it happens. Oh, well, it's not the end of the world. Um, art lines are established every day in hospitals. Arter arteries can be catheterized. However, they're done so for monitoring blood pressures and fluid gases and stuff like that, or uh, blood gases, not for administration of medication and fluid. 
If you do administer fluids through an art line, it's going to cause a washout of the capillaries distal to that insertion site. And so um, if you pushed fluids through an art line, their whole hand, for example, if the art was like a radial uh, art line, their whole hand will go pale as the blood um, is flushed out of the capillaries and then it's not getting oxygen. So that's why you don't administer fluids through it. If you started an art line by accident, you know, you were trying to go for the vein and you ended up hitting an artery, oh well, you just have to remove the catheter and hold very strong direct pressure on that site for a minimum of five minutes. Um, that would be on a radial. You start getting up into the AC or to the brachials and stuff. I really hope you're not starting art lines up there, but sometimes weird things happen. But you start getting into those realms, you have a bit more of an issue. Um, so all you have to do is hold direct pressure for about five minutes on it. All right, so pyrogenic reactions is when the patient starts developing a fever as a result of the infusion. It's a much more significant uh, reaction. Again, don't use um, that site. Um, and then you want to maintain that uh, or keep that bag and fluid set up to find out what in our, what is in it that caused that reaction. I've already talked about circulatory overload. Um, don't want to, you know, if you're giving too much fluids, you slow or stop the IV infusion. Uh, keep their head up. They might need oxygen. Generally, that's the biggest thing. Uh, they, it's possible they'll need a diuretic, but um, that will often become with medical control. All right, air embolism. I mentioned this a minute ago with the um, EJs. This is when air gets into the venous system and then creates a clot in the lungs or a blockage in the lung uh, blood vessels causing the pulmonary embolism. This can happen with the EJ. It could happen if you didn't have, uh, you didn't clear all the air out of your bag or out of your IV line or out of a syringe before administering the Medicaid uh, fluids and you start injecting a lot of air into them. If you suspect that they've had an air embolism, remember air will float in the veins. So place the patient on their left side. This puts the heart lower than the vena cava, so the air would ideally stay in the vena cava, and then elevate their feet and keep their head low. So lay them flat, elevate their feet, and keep them on their left side, and ideally the air would float to the... Um, lower extremities where it's not going to cause harm and then it will slowly be absorbed into the body it, the body will absorb the air it will disappear the problem is if it's a large quantity of air and it goes into the lungs it will cause the embolism and result in a uh, could result in death or at least significant injury um, rather quickly in the lungs you get put down in the feet it's no big deal it'll be absorbed by the body without problems <laughs> Sometimes patients will pass out when we start an IV. Obviously, the patient should be lying down or sitting down when we start the IV. We shouldn't be starting that IV on people who are sitting, uh, standing up. But ask them, you know, hey, well, what, you know, you ever had this done? Is there any concern? You know, don't watch. Give them a warning, and then it's if they pass out, they pass out. You know, not a big deal if it's vasovagal. Catheter shear, this is another cause of risk for your embolisms, is if you have ad, uh, advanced a catheter too far, um, it's started to bend over or something like that, um, and then you uh, tried to withdraw it back onto the stylet. And that will result in um, cutting the tip of the catheter off on a um, on your IV catheter. So let me pull this up over here. All right, so you know we're used to the IV catheter, the distal IV catheter, um, looking something like that. See the catheter all along the stylet there. Here's an example of the um, catheter uh, 
Now that looks like a Clavian. Let's see, where... Um, so what happens in this scenario is the catheter bends over and then is withdrawn back onto the stylet. Uh, that's a retrograde. That's a whole different design. Um, it actually cuts a portion of the tip of the catheter off. Um, most there. There's a good example. Most catheters have a radio opaque stripe in them, so that if a portion of it gets cut off, it can be um, retrieved. So you can see here in this picture. Um, that the catheter started to bend, they advanced the stylet back through the catheter, and then the stylet punctured out the side of the catheter um, like that. Well, that's not going to help anybody, but in some cases, it's possible that that puncture could be enough to cut or slice the entire tip of that catheter off. And now that catheter is floating through the vasculature and will result in a pulmonary embolism. Um, so that's the catheter shear. And for that reason, you never retract the catheter or I should say you never advance the stylet back into the catheter um, once you've started advancing the catheter into um, the vein. All right, let's take a quick break here. You guys wake up, stretch your legs, um, and then we'll talk about IOs. All right, so IOs. There's a couple of different locations that we can start IOs. Uh, most commonly is going to be either the humeral head or the proximal tibia. Um, the humoral head is an extremely effective rapid uh, infusion location. You can really get uh, quick access to the heart. It's actually much faster getting medication through a humoral head IO to the heart than it is even the ACIV. Um, the problem in my perspective of humoral head IOs is in a pre-hospital environment, things are very dynamic. Patients moving, arms get in the way, like you got a cardiac arrest or something, you're trying to do chest compressions. The arm is supposed to be abducted like this. Um, in order to uh, properly locate the area on the shoulder um, and then start your IO um, right here. So if the patient, you know, you're doing CPR kind of makes a problem because you're put, trying to put their hand right over uh, where uh, we're, we're doing CPR. If you've started it and then if they're particularly muscular or really overweight or something like that, and then their arm falls down or moves out, it's actually quite easy for it to dislodge that IO and now you've lost your access. And I've seen some IOs dislodged that way. For that reason, during cardiac arrest patients and such, I prefer using the proximal tibia. You, know, you just find the uh, interior surface, interior flat surface of the tibia, uh, move two fingers down uh, from the process uh, just below the knee and then place it in that s surface. Quick, easy, especially if you're using the um, easy IO setup um, or easy IO tool. Um, IOs are really designed for all ages now. You don't want to use easy IOs on little babies. You could just use the needle without the drill. Uh, you don't want to use an easy IO on an extremity that has had a joint replacement. Um, you can use it on a different extremity. And you don't want to use it on a bone that is already fractured. Um, for example, though, like, let's say you're doing a tibial IO, if they have a femur fracture on the same leg, you're risking not having any access because of the uh, veins being damaged from the femur fracture. Um, 
Okay, so let's say you're going to do a tibial I.O., the hip replacement's not going to be a concern because the the veins coming out of the tibia do not run into the um, femur. Where you don't want to do it is if they've had a knee replacement um, because the knee replacement, they actually run a spike of titanium down inside the tibia, and then the I.O. is going to hit it, and it yeah, that's just going to be a problem. Um, so it's it's the knee replacements that you're worried about. That and shoulder, obviously, if they've had a shoulder replacement. Um, the uh, when I went through paramedic school, everybody was like, "Oh, IOs are just a last ditch effort, or you know, they're a last case scenario. They're really slow fluid administration." No. IOs are just as rapid as any other uh, vascular access. The, the uh, marrow of the bones are extremely vascular. Um, in a lot of tissue, or excuse me, a lot of patients don't have a lot of complaint, pain, or discomfort from the insertion. However, they will with fluid administration as fluid flows. <laughs> So, as you can see here, kids less than six years old who need fluids, IOs may be a good uh, first line option now. IOs also give you the option to, uh, well, no, IOs are normally limited to about 24 hours. After 24 hours, they're probably going to have to be removed. We don't typically do sternum IOs in the pre-hospital world because most of our critical patients we're considering for uh, the need of a cardiac um, or CPR. So the sternal IO kind of gets in the way. Uh, military uses sternal IOs uh, quite a bit. Um, they use spring-loaded IO inject in insertion tools. You can see some of the pictures here. This is the easy IO in three of the pictures, and then that's the sternal gun that's, uh, as you can see, right at the manubrium right here at the top of the sternum. Um, this uh, humoral head IO, that arm should be abducted adducted in order to get that to work properly. Um, without adducting the arm, it's going to be really hard to find the processes and locate the appropriate location. I have never seen or read any literature recommending the use of the distal tibia. It is possible. It could work. I'm just saying I've not seen it recommended, and I don't know why you would choose that location over the proximal tibia. Well, then I do a humoral head because the Lucas, the patient's arms are pulled up like this, and that's pretty close to the uh, abducted position, and so I'd go for the humoral head. Interesting. I don't want to argue with you, but I've never heard that. Um, All right, looking for Lucas device IO um, and IO use. All right, so um, these are some of the old, older style IOs. I mean, we still stock them here are at my department. Uh, the, the Jim Sheedy uh, is the blue one, and then you uh, I can't remember what they call the black one there, uh, but. 
the Jim Sheedy is really effective for pediatrics uh, because it's uh, easily adjustable for depth, whereas the uh, black one there does not have as much uh, depth adjustment. That one, I believe, was intended for use in the humoral head for manual um this is the fast IO. Um, yeah, don't use this for children. This is what the military uses or, or things similar to this. Um, it says it can be used during cardiac arrest, but if we break the sternum, if we break all our ribs or whatever, then it might not be working. So again, not for most of the cardiac arrests that we do uh, in the pre-hospital world. Ah, I see that. Um, there it is. Sorry. I know how I bumped that. So anyway, easy IO. Uh, it's a little pricey. The the needles are still a bit pricey. Uh, so a lot of people get pissy with you when you use them. Um, at our department, we pretty much only stock the red 15 millimeter and the yellow 45 millimeters. Um, if you have, if you don't need the full 45 millimeters, you don't insert it all the way. It's it's that simple. Like, um, but we use the red ones for the babies, and like I said, you can insert those by hand on uh, your neonates and such. They don't, you don't need the drill to put those in. That's the bone injection gun. Again, it's another spring-loaded device. Um, looks horrible, in my opinion. Um, they really are. They are so uh, creative with the names, right? We got the big. We got the the new interosseous device, the Neo. Like, like really, guys? Like, put some effort into this. Um, all right. Not gonna talk about how to do the fast. It's just not something we need to worry about. So what are some concerns? If the IO needle goes too far through the bone, comes out the other side. For that reason, when stabilizing the extremity, when you're gonna start it, never hold the opposite side of the extremity like this. Hold the leg, right? Always stabilize holding it this way and then insert the IO that way where you don't risk punching a hole in your own finger. Um, but it'll start swelling up um, with when you give fluid just like a blown IV, infiltrating IV. Osteomyelitis is an infection. It can or is an infection of the bone. It can happen with IO insertion, although it's not extremely common. In order to prevent it, a lot of times hospitals will administer antibiotics to patients who received an IO as a prophylaxis. Um, but good cleaning and prep site prep is necessary to uh, keep that from happening. Uh, with adults, you don't really need to worry about the growth plate, but with babies, you really do. And so um, be very careful starting um, an IO in the baby in the young pediatrics. Uh, make certain you've identified your landmarks well. And we will go over this when, um, when we meet on Friday. I've seen this happen. Uh, in proper technique, yep. Hey, you with the microphone. <laughs> Is that Frankie? Um, um, a fracture, a bone fracture or something like that. They're not any more of a concern there. So, I uh, already mentioned a lot of these. If we already have an IV, no need for the IO. If there's a bone fracture of that same bone, osteoporosis, present in the elderly, uh, probably should have avoided. Osteogenesis imperfecta, this is very weak bones. We'll see this in the pediatric um, population. Um, knee replacements in the same thing. And I don't know why we need to say it, but don't start an IO in a prosthetic limb. 
Okay? Don't do that. But if the patient has a prosthetic leg on their right leg, but a leg their mama gave them on their left leg, then you can start the IO on their left leg, right? Like the prosthetic limb being present on one side doesn't prevent you from using the other, you know, mama given leg. So, all right, and those are some of the concerns with IOs. We will go over IO administration again on Friday. Um, this will get back into MedAdmin, and we kind of, we're going to go over some math on Friday. But then we'll any of the rest of the medication administration, we really are going to do hands on, like drawing up meds, practicing, and things like that. So. Um,